Sing the big way. Sorry, yeah. I just need to go to the water. Yeah, yeah. So much of anxiety to run out of the next session. Are you staying for the next session? So am I. So we'll just. Yeah. I'm going to take another. Not at all. If you want to take fast. Yeah. I'll pick that up. Muhammad, uh, you should be able to hear the, the, the room. If you can speak, please, you are muted now. We can hear you. We will keep you unmuted, Muhammad. So if you want to talk through your phone, it should be heard in the room. I recognize you. <laughs> How's life? I understand. Very, very good. I mean, thanks to people like you, my life becomes a lot easier. <laughs> so I cannot thank you enough. Uh, you are the glue that holds this whole crazy thing together. Uh, really uh, trust me, I know how much fun that can be. I think everyone knows. Exactly, exactly. What is the presentation? Well, it's very exciting. That's that's after mine. Okay. It's not shared. You see, look at the WebEx screen now. You see, this is what everyone is seeing here. If you put your presentation, you put it here. Don't touch this. Okay. Simply, but you need to share it through share file if it's in the computer or share application and PowerPoint. Okay. Okay? Simply that. Okay. Because if you just open the computer it will be seen here but not in WebEx. So okay. you just need to share in WebEx. So it will be seen here sure. because this computer is being seen okay. here. But okay. also in WebEx. So put this one here. Derek, you got that figured out? I do, I do. Muhammad, you are you are muted if you want to know. Yeah, but you can also request the floor. <laughs> this is Luis from IGF Secretariat by the way. Hello, can I be heard in the room? Is the volume... Slides are still open. Yes, I just wanted to open yours. Yeah, they're good to go. Yeah, thank you, sir.
Hello, this is Luis speaking. Dinello? Dinello? I can't hear. Hello? Hello. I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Hey, Jenny. But for some reason, it cannot be heard. What is happening oh. here? Uh, let's see. The remote monitor is. Uh, Hello. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was working. Uh, uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Bonjour. Excuse me. Hello. 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 Audio. Audio. You need to you see you are not sharing it. You need to share once you are done. Uh, so this one is, is sharing. The other one. So we get to share this one as well. Yeah. Go to share. Go to app. App. Share. Share. Share application, share application, Microsoft PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's here, you see? Okay, great. Okay, but just try to put it, not, there is this window, stop this window, go to this window. You have to just put all the windows that are not used. You see? Now it's perfect, you see? Okay. Now if I want to go full yeah. screen. Uh, no, do the full screen, no, not full screen because you will stop this. Okay, you so need to full screen, just you can sure. just view and view for a moment, this. View. Preview. view. Okay. Click there. You see, you have it bigger now. Excellent. Okay, and you can go down. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Now, the audio. If I speak through WebEx, it does not arrive to the to the room as as it did before in the in the in the dans la session précédente in my session. Si je parle ici, regardez. Je parle. Je suis connecté sur WebEx. Je suis connecté sur WebEx. Amour. Oui. Ça marche pas. Je parle. Je parle. Là, ça marchait tout à l'heure avec ce qu'on a eu le remote tout à l'heure. Oui, voilà, voilà. Oui, je parle, voilà. Et ça n'arrive. Où est-ce que ça doit arriver Où est-ce que ça doit arriver C'est pour. Dans euh... le speaker Dans le speaker En principe, ça a passé. Tout à l'heure, ça marchait très bien. <rire> ce qu'on va faire peut-être, euh, c'est de euh, reconnecter la wheel. Disconnect the audio and I reconnect, okay? Okay. We'll start in two minutes. Gunella and Shadi, are you on the line? Change settings. So it's connected through speakers and microphone black magic. Okay. Okay, let's Pinella and Shadi. But the speakers it should be no for the audio to come in. Or it should be image pro two. Or it should be image pro two Intel whatever. It should be speakers or image pro two. Sigo please. Now we must speakers. Speakers. Yeah, it's okay. Can we hear it in my image? So which one is it? Speakers? Speakers, yes. Hola Sara. If I speak in the room, in the room, it arrives. It arrives. Okay. okay, perfect. So it's okay. So if Mohammed talks, he will be heard. Okay. Okay. Uh, they're all in the room, and they all have heads. Okay, now you share again. Test with the remote people so we can hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Muhammad, we, we are just speaking in the room. Can someone uh, talk and mute uh, yourself and speak? Maybe Yunela, you can speak, try to speak. Yes, uh, Jenny? Yes, we can hear. But who, who was that? But I am getting the. Uh, ah, good. Shabi? That was Shadi. Hello. Perfect. We can hear all you. That's Hello, nice. this is Carnella. Perfect. We can hear all you well in the room. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, good morning, ladies, everybody. Thanks for coming back, those who came back, and thanks for all the new attendees who came in who weren't here before. My name is Jerry Ellis, I'm from Dublin, and I'm here uh, chairing this session on behalf of the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability called 1.3 Billion Reasons for Making Your Technology Accessible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick introduction, then I'm going to ask each of our five speakers just to say two sentences to introduce themselves. So each person, just two sentences, and that will do two things. It'll introduce you to them, but it'll also make sure that we can hear the remote people properly. So we're killing two birds with one stone. Then each person will do a presentation, and we're going to have time at the end for, for questions and answers. Why 1.3 billion, you say? There are 1.3 billion people with disabilities in the world, according to the global report on, on a global economic report on disability. They control 1.2 trillion dollars of disposable income annually. And of course, no person with disability is an island. They have family, they have friends, people who are emotionally attached to them. And if you add that, that's another 2.2 billion people who control 8 trillion dollars worth of uh, disposable income every year. That's a huge potential market, apart from the in inclusion and whatever that, that accessibility gives. So what we're talking about today is why make people, why make technology, why make society accessible? And we're going to look at some of the policies, we're going to look at some of the standards, and we've got a wonderful set of speakers who are going to give us a very broad uh, view of what, what we're talking about. So first, Ginella, can you just give us one, maybe two sentences about yourself? This is Gonella Estbury. And we have a big echo here. Uh, so, I'm from Australia. Uh, I am a, a member of Women with Disabilities Australia, a member of the uh, Australian chapter of the Internet Society and also the Disability chapter of the Internet Society and have been involved with uh, disability issues as a person with a disability for around 25 years. Thank you. Okay, Shadi, two sentences about yourself. You know what's more important about you than I do, so you tell us. Have you got Shadi? Hello, my name is Shadi Abu Zara. I am taking from the captions that it's my turn. Um, so uh, I work for the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C an international standards uh, body that develops standards for the World Wide Web. Um, and I focus on making the web accessible to people with different disabilities um, since um, also nearly two decades now. Shabir, give us a quick introduction to yourself. Very quick. Uh, hello, uh, since I've been unmuted, I can definitely understand that it's my turn. I am Mohammed Shabir. I am from Pakistan. Uh, by profession, I am a researcher of uh, international relations. And uh, I am also member and member board of director of uh, Internet Society Islamabad chapter. Uh, in accessibility field, I've been working for the last five or six years or so. Thank you. Thank you. Just for our remote moderator, it seems that we can hear our speakers, but they can't hear us, if we could fix that. Derek, on my right-hand side here. Yes, hi. My name is Derek Cogburn. I'm a professor at American University in the School of International uh, Service and in the Kogad School of Business, focusing on uh, international communication and information technology and analytics. I'm also executive director of our Institute on Disability and Public Policy and co-director of our Internet Governance Lab. Wonderful. And last but definitely not least, Anthony Giannamis. Thank you. My name is Anthony Giannamis, and I do uh, research and teaching in universal design of ICT 
at the Department of Computer Science at Oslo Metropolitan University. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think you can hear from now with just such a variety of top quality speakers. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this today. So, Ginella, let's go back to Ginella, and um, can you give us your presentation, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, and uh, I will um, have a very uh, brief presentation, and it relates to the and I still have a very bad echo, so I'll try and ignore that. So, the Internet of Things and People with Disability. Uh, and it's called IoT for short. There are many different definitions, but you could say that it's a the internet. And these are often everyday objects. It can be doorbells, machines. For example, um, the Internet Society mentions that uh, uh, shoes um, can track your heartbeat and alert you to health problems. A TV can record your movements and conversations, which is a bit scary for privacy reasons. And there are smart transport systems, uh, both public and private, as some examples. Uh, so we've already, I've already mentioned that um, with the ref rapid evolution of IoT, there, there's a lot of challenges to, to do with privacy, security, and also interoperability. And these sort of issues are mainstream issues and just as relevant to accessibility of IoT devices for people with disability. And I mainly talk about um, IoT in the smart home environment. Uh, in the past, people with disability, particularly physical disability, have used ambient assistive technology. I wonder has Canella's internet gone? Canella? I'm presuming you're not here. Uh, I'm still getting the echo. Sorry, no, Gunella, we, we are not hearing you well now with your internet connection, probably. Are you in Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi, you need to probably move because the audio also for the captioners is be, being very difficult to take. Gunella? I continue? Yeah. Yeah, you are, you are being very blurry. Your, your audio comes very blurry, sorry. You need to have a better internet connection or uh, some part of your intervention was well heard, but maybe if you cannot recover it, you could maybe try to write it. But let's try, if you can, uh, maybe a little bit more. And otherwise, she may, can maybe talk a little bit later if you manage to have a better internet connection. Gunella, maybe we'll move on to Shadi and come back to you after Shabir. Give you a chance to maybe redial in. Okay. These yes, are, that's okay. These are the trials and tribulations of international remote participation, ladies and gentlemen, so I apologize for that. Shadi, can we move on to you and we'll come back to Gunella in a few minutes? Shadi? Yes, hello. So I think the room needs. Yeah, thank you for muting. Um, I think that sometimes interferes with the speaker. I was actually hearing Gunella um, speak, so, um, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jerry, for this opportunity. Um, the title is 1.3 billion, uh, 1 billion reasons for making your tech 
technology accessible. Um, and I think there may be even more reasons than that. I think these are the, uh, uh, this is the 15 to 20% of the population that actually need accessibility. But I think uh, we at W3C look at accessibility more broadly. Uh, it is a requirement, it is essential for people with disabilities, but also beneficial for many more. Um, and uh, there, there are many examples, I like to compare that. As a person with a disability using a wheelchair myself, I like to use the built environment as an anal analogy because that sometimes makes it a bit more tangible for people to understand and see what we mean. Now everybody uses an elevator, um, but nobody thinks of it as an assistive technology. Um, but this is actually very similar to what we have in the mobile, uh, in, in, in the digital world. Uh, we have um, accessibility features and functionality, such as text-to-speech, voice input, um, keyboard navigation, all, all, all the like, um, being able to customize the presentation of text, making it more readable, more understandable. Um, and these are all essential for people with disabilities. Without these, people with disabilities are essentially excluded from accessing technology, from being able to use it effectively. Uh, but at the same time, these features also benefit everyone. And I think similar to an elevator, uh, we have to see this as the standard way of building technology. Um, very often we hear the question about cost. How much is this going to cost us and how many wheelchair users are there to build an elevator? If you would take only this cost measure, um, it's a very skewed way of looking at it. If you look at the cost, you need to look at the benefit as well. And you need to not only calculate the 15 to 20 percent of the population that needs this accessibility, but the maybe two thirds of the population in some studies that benefit from accessibility features. Um, what I'm referring to here is actually a study made by Microsoft um, um, already back in 2003. They commissioned Forrester Research to look at why they should invest in accessibility on their Windows operating system. And they came to the conclusion that about 15 to 20 percent of the um, American workforce, it was back then a study uh, local to the US, that they require accessibility features in order to be able to use the computer. But that nearly two thirds of the population actually benefit from these accessibility features. Again, these are things like captioning, like being able to uh, increase the font size, uh, being able to scan the headings or use text-to-speech to interact with, with the computer. Um, and since then, they've actually changed the phrasing. Instead of using, um, calling it accessibility, they call it now ease of use because this is what it is. It makes the technology e easier to use for everyone and more accessible specifically for people with disabilities. Um, so, um, in, 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 that, in, in, in that approach, um, accessibility standards are an important tool um, in order to guide you to what features when you're designing a product or a service, what are the requirements, what considerations do you need to have uh, in, in your products and services from the beginning and follow that through so that at the end you have an accessible uh, an inclusive product and service. Um, and the standards from W3C specifically here I want to mention, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. WCAG is an internationally recognized standard for web content accessibility. And with web content, we really mean the broad definition of anything that is on the web. And today, this means videos and audios and forms and text and images, all these things on the web. Increasingly, these are accessed using mobile apps. Also, these are part of uh, the web in our view. Increasingly, even home appliances, digital televisions, uh, all these things are now becoming web-enabled and part of the world wide web. Um, and, 
and, and part of the Internet of Things, so to say. Um, yeah, um, in addition to providing these core technical standards for accessibility, W3C also provides a lot of educational resources on how to make, uh, how to apply these standards in practice because part of the big issue that we think is part of, a, you know, the, the barrier to accessibility is not only the technical standards but also the lack of awareness, the lack of knowledge and skills amongst many of the designers and the developers and people who are responsible, so the project managers and the executives, who are not aware of what the accessibility requirements are and how to apply them in practice. So this is part of our mission. We're more coming from the technical angle and we try to explain these standards uh, to the widest audience possible. Um, um, and and, and uh, in order to ensure that accessibility is included in all web products and services. Thank you. Thank you, Shadi. It's very interesting. I think the question of standards is so true. We need something to measure against. If you, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Shabir, I think we, we'll move on to <clears throat> Shabir now. And can you give us our your presentation, please? Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you, Jay. Uh, hello and good evening. I hope you are very well. And Shah talked about very uh, detailed in, in the responsibility and importance and significance of the standards. Uh, I will be talking about the challenges uh, in in the domain of accessibility and what are the differences particularly as I see uh, in developed and developing countries. Uh, a small disclaimer here that I am speaking on my personal behalf and not on the behalf of the institution or the university that I work for. So uh, this is uh, my personal opinion and my and the speech that I am going to uh, give here is uh, my personal observation. So I may be wrong and the list and challenges that I am going to highlight here is not exhaustive. Uh, it's unending and anyone can add to this uh, these challenges, but as I see uh, is the uh, there are multiple challenges uh, those relate to policy awareness and technical domains uh, first a little bit i will talk about the uh, accessibility uh, in pakistan uh, as i uh, the country i i hail from and i come from uh, before I talk about the accessibility in, in Pakistan, when Shadi was talking about the, uh, I will just refer to one thing, when Shadi was talking about the standards and the, and the, uh, st the importance of following standards, I'll give you just uh, one personal example that here uh, at, at IGF, I've been uh, using this online tool, but uh, it, it is not possible, it is not even accessible, rather I should say, for me uh, to mute or unmute myself or uh, to raise hand to ask for the floor from the remote moderator. So this is just one example. And, and as uh, some would say, these are small things, but in the, in the longer run, these small things do matter. And if the standards are, are followed, then we also need to have some audits as well. Uh, talking about the accessibility uh, in Pakistan, uh, there have been uh, a number of efforts uh, starting uh, in two, uh, 1980s. Uh, when uh, a decade for accessibility for person, a person with disabilities at international level was uh, celebrated from 1983 to 92. Uh, mainly the efforts for uh, persons with disabilities started uh, at that time. Uh, from then, uh, we have uh, traveled a long journey. In 2009, Pakistan signed a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and in 2011, uh, July 6 to be exact, Pakistan, uh, government of Pakistan ratified it. So uh, 
since yeah. then there have been a uh, number of efforts and uh, if if i give you one example of challenges uh, between the developed and developing countries uh, before 2014 uh, for persons with visual impairment in pakistan it was not possible and even banks uh, private institutions or the government banks would not allow a persons with visual person with visual impairment to carry debit or credit card or use uh, e uh, services of the banks uh, but in 2014 uh, thanks to the governments uh, or uh, some government institutions uh, state bank of pakistan particularly and some other organizations uh we negotiated with the state bank of pakistan it it drafted a complete policy and now uh, banks are 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 bound to give all the electronic services including atm debit cards credit cards and all electronic facilities uh, to to visually impaired customers as they would issue these facilities to any any other customer so this is just one example uh if i list uh, these challenges uh, of accessibility uh, for persons with disabilities i see uh, these are main uh, four challenges uh, there may be uh, again i would say uh, multiple issues and uh, can uh, people can uh, uh, we can discuss this in the interactive session exhaustively uh first of all is the uh, uh the limited uh, low income uh, uh versus high cost of the technology we have talked much about the income versus uh, cost of the technology uh, in in and this is the issue in the developed world as well but when you uh, come to the developing countries where uh, gdp uh, ratio is already low uh the technology versus cost of the technology is is uh, very high second is the uh, absence of the uh, accessibility policy or uh, there is a gap between what policy state and what is practiced so uh, absence of the policy means uh, uh, as i mentioned that uh, in in before 2014 banks even would not allow uh, persons with visual impairment in my country to carry uh, the atm or debit cards Uh, but now there is a policy but there are number of uh, things to to work on and and if i understand it right bangladesh is still one country where banks are banks do not allow uh, persons with visual impairment to carry uh, or to use these services so and afghanistan is one of those two so so this uh, th this is some kind of uh, a gap which needs to be bridged uh then there is a gap between what policy states and what is practiced sometimes it happens that uh, policies are made for persons with disabilities uh, but uh, the difference between developed and developing countries is that uh, the developed countries they have uh, strong legal uh, and institutional norms uh, and the institutions they they made uh, the uh, the companies and the people uh, to to follow up on the accessibility rights for instance if there is uh, some issue that comes under the under the section 508 uh, in united states uh, the companies and even the government institutions can be drag into the court so people have been uh, fighting cases on on those as well uh, but uh, in certain developing uh, developing countries uh, it becomes uh, difficult then there is lack of awareness about accessibility uh, sometimes by developers uh, when the service providers and persons with disabilities themselves uh, developers uh, shadi talked about uh, in detail service providers uh, sometimes like banks and other <coughs> institutions they do not they do not know when they are uh, procuring uh, some some uh, uh, technology for their uh, newly uh, started or newly installed uh, buildings or or infrastructures uh they do not uh, sometimes they have a lack of awareness about the accessibility features and what accessibility they can use uh and this this create this causes a problem as well 
and lastly persons with disabilities themselves sometimes the technology is available uh, but uh, persons with disabilities uh, they do not they are not aware of the of the technology which is uh, available for them and to make uh, the make the life easier for them so it it becomes uh, an issue as well uh lack of accessibility training uh, this is another uh, issue and uh, this i have been uh, talking about here in pakistan and we are hoping that uh, anam, uh, a couple of universities have started now uh, uh, including uh, training uh, in the in the uh, in the bs programs so uh, on the developer side uh, what we are doing here is we are trying to add some courses in the bs uh, uh, software uh, designs or other engineering programs uh, so that person uh, doing the uh, uh, masters degrees or advanced degrees in in software engineering development and design etc they should also be aware of the accessibility and its needs uh because what happens is that if you teach uh, if you if you teach up a, a student uh, for four years uh, just uh, the design for the businesses then uh, it is it's it becomes difficult for them to follow the accessibility standards and to relearn from the uh, to re relearn uh, as so as to include the accessibility issues or standards uh, in their uh, designing or the development side so so uh, my effort here has been to to uh, uh, encourage uh, students and faculty uh, particularly faculties to offer uh, such courses on access which which made the students uh, about awareness and uh, significance of the persons uh, with disabilities and their issues uh, i also i talked about the uh, policies uh, talking about uh, my, the example of pakistan uh, uh, last year uh, the policy was formulated on ICT, uh, which is called here in Pakistan, Digital Pakistan Policy. Uh, the policy carries uh, a certain uh, guidelines, uh, though that address the issues of persons with disabilities. And as we speak, uh, a draw, uh, an action plan is being drafted and work uh, to to implement that policy. So the policy has uh, the guidelines, but let's see. We are working. Uh, we are still working on that as well. that whether those uh, policy guideline those action plan how uh, those guidelines would be implemented and what kind of uh, instructions would be there in the action plan to implement the uh, the provisions uh, of uh, accessibility for persons with disabilities and the good thing was that the guidelines uh, uh, while uh, being drafting the policy Uh, the ministry of it and the other government institutions they involve the persons with disabilities and ask for their input uh, as well uh, this is one example and this i think is the best approach if we want to make uh, the uh, the the accessibility digital accessibility and digital environment accessible for persons uh, with disabilities we also need uh, to follow uh, to follow a policy which includes the input uh, uh, by the persons who are actually uh, suffering from the disability because it is them who will have to live with the results and often uh, more often than not developing countries it happens that policy makers they uh, consider themselves all knowing and they say that whatever uh, we do or whatever we think is the best option uh, this perhaps is the the wrong way we uh, somehow need to change uh, change this this approach uh, lastly i would i would say uh, that the title of this workshop talks about 1.3 billion reasons so this is not the uh, end or uh, static uh, number this dynamic 1.3 could be 1.6, and we all know that uh, circumstances. Uh, please forgive me for being cynical, but we we all know what would happen to us tomorrow. So, uh, so tomorrow, some of us, God forbid, may also need these kind of visions. So, from a cynical point, 
accessibility uh, wherever we are working make the environment accessible so if tomorrow we need it we also may be able to buy this uh, the thank you thank you shabir Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to try Gunella again, all the way to Australia. Gunella, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Can we hear loud and clear? And uh, thank you, Jerry, for giving me another chance. Uh, I have, have uh, reduced my volume, so hopefully uh, it works uh, well, and uh, it sounds like it does. Um, I, I started my presentation presentation and I'm a bit reluctant to uh, start from the beginning Jerry so maybe I can uh, continue from where we were cut off is that uh, acceptable perfect you were saying that security was just as important for the rest of society as just people with disabilities so if you want to carry on yeah please do okay <clears> hmm <throat> Uh, right, so we were talking about uh, people with physical disability using um, ambient assistive technology, uh, which uh, used to be called environmental control units, and they're designed to support independent living. They could control lighting, doors, heating, entertainment, and security systems and were integrated through accessible interfaces through voice commands or other specially designed control systems and these assistive technologies were very expensive now we see google amazon apple and many other major corporations offering smart home systems for the general public at low cost which is really great but now people with disability may encounter new barriers due to the lack of interoperability between devices and inaccessible user interfaces. So we need to ensure, and we've heard already from speakers about uh, these type of issues, we need to ensure that mainstream software is interoperable with various devices and also with a person's assistive technology. So, for example, and I think it's an example Shadi has used previously, is a home assistant device can turn on or off a TV, but not, not um, able to turn on captions on the TV. So the way interfaces communicate with each other may be limited due to business decisions to operate in a closed or semi-enclosed environment. In other words, with particular operating systems and hardware and software part of that. This is obviously detrimental for consumers and it may lead to negative business outcomes in the medium to long term. I remember many, many, many years ago when we first had SMS text messaging and, and phone companies said, okay, you can only send text within our own company. And they finally realized that they would make a lot more money if they allowed the text messaging to go across various networks. And uh, that, of course, has matured. Now we need to see the maturing of some of these IoT systems. Um, just also wanted to mention that in Europe, there is um, in train economic legislation relating to the internal market which may which may include in interoperability this is something to watch carefully so when user interfaces are based on universal design principles devices meet the needs of many more people in the community which we've already heard and we can't emphasize this enough really so if we have intuitive and accessible user interface design, it means that people of all ages and mental abilities can easily use a home assistant device. Markets with aging populations especially benefit. User testing and advice by people with disability in the early stages of a design process 
will lead to more user-friendly and accessible products. So while product safety and reliability are important for everyone, it is vital for people with disability to be able to function independently. IoT issues such as privacy and security are potentially harmful for people with disability and older people. For example, with health data that is used in a home care environment. So it's the Internet of Things, IoT, IOT, and accessibility should be addressed in policy, research, and technical settings, along with other IoT issues. And and this should be included in any policy development. And of course, that policy needs to be translated into action. So the time to do that is now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gunella. And just, just to make a point, we had one person there from um, Australia and two from very other, very varying parts of the world. And if they weren't able to access remote participation, they couldn't give us their words of wisdom here today. It in itself is a demonstration of the importance of accessibility. And we can't even begin to tell you how difficult it was to get Shabir on board because of the inaccessibility of WebEx. In itself, the fact that they're here is a great achievement. So thank you to all three remote speakers. And um, now we're going to start hearing from speakers here in the room. First on my right is Professor Derek Coburn. So Derek, looking forward to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. <clears throat> and thank you very much to our remote speakers. Uh, thank you to the DCAD uh, Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability for uh, inviting us to participate here and to continue this uh, important work with, uh, with IGF. Uh, it's also good to see uh, so many people here for an accessibility workshop uh, starting this morning at 9 o'clock with uh, the morning session uh, and continuing on. Uh, and this is part of a number of workshops here at IGF related to accessibility and disability, including on Sunday where we had the uh, discotheque uh, on uh, accessibility and development. So really excited to participate uh, in this process. And I want to share a little bit about uh, disability inclusive development um, as we think about how do all of the various policy frameworks that we're talking about really accelerate uh, disability inclusive development uh, around the world. So I want to do four things this morning. I'd like to say a little bit about uh, big data and text mining. I should have given you my full title that I moderated uh, understanding Disability Inclusive Development Through Text Mining, uh, IGF, SDGs, and the CRPD. So I'll start this morning by saying a little bit about what we mean by big data and text mining, some of the kinds of data that's available for this work. Um, I'll give you a method methodology to use. Some of you may be interested in pursuing some of these uh, techniques. And I'll give you some key approaches that we use within that methodology to answer questions and problems uh, from big data uh, text mining sources. And then I'll try to do, with whatever time I have left, three brief case studies uh, looking at text mining around the Internet Governance Forum, the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, the CRPD. So first, let me say a bit about big data analytics and text mining. So Internet Governance Research has been around since the mid uh, to the late 1990s uh, as an interdisciplinary research domain. And if you look on the screen here, I have a slide showing Google searches for Internet Governance. And you can see that around 2005, 2006, it got a big boost, which was focused on WISIS. Uh, the World Summit on the Information Society really accelerated how many people think about uh, internet governance research and moved a lot of people into this uh, process. Uh, some of you that may be here on Thursday, uh, the GIGANET, the Global Internet Governance Academic Network, uh, will help hold its 13th uh, annual symposium uh, associated with IGF on Thursday. So big data is focused on what some people call the three V's of big data, volume, velocity, and variety. So there's a lot of it. It's coming very fast, and there are many different types of data that we can use for big data analytics. In particular, text is one of those largest sources that tends to go uh, unutilized uh, the most. 
So for yourself right now, think about the sources of text that you can imagine that are available for project work. So uh, archives of international organizations, meeting transcripts such as the uh, IGF meeting transcripts, uh, email listservs, reports, uh, speeches, uh, social media, legal documents, uh, all of these are available for us with the growing amount of computational tools. Now some of the tools are commercial tools and I'll sh what I'm going to show you today are some of the commercial tools that we use. Uh, it's called the Provolis uh, Pro Suite. Uh, but there are also open source tools um, that we use and that I teach in my classes, such as R, um, which is an open source uh, data management uh, software. So the methodology we use for this is called the CRISP-DM. It stands for Cross-Industry Standard Process for Data Mining. Uh, I like to promote this because many people don't know how to approach data mining projects. And this is a very um, straightforward way of thinking about a data mining project. It starts by very clearly identifying what's the purpose, what's the problem that you're trying to address through the data. So you think about all the text that you have, what kind of problems might you want to address with that text? Uh, what's the availability of that data? Uh, then you have to prepare the data. You have to develop and assess models that allow you to analyze uh, that data, evaluate your findings, and then deploy the results and rinse and repeat as necessary. So uh, this is uh, a very standard process for uh, data mining. So quickly, I want to talk about some of the approaches that we take through data, and then I'll turn to our case studies. So the first are what we call inductive approaches. So you have a big corpus, and you're trying to understand uh, what's in that corpus without coming to that corpus with any specific questions. So you want to know what are some of the key trends and themes and patterns uh, in that data? How does that change over time? How does it change by key variables such as maybe uh, date or organizational type or person? Um, so you can take an inductive uh, approach. You can do descriptive analysis of keywords, of key phrases. You can use a technique called entity extraction um, where you can do topic modeling and you can pull out named entities out of a data set. You can also take a deductive approach, which means you're going into the data set asking specific questions. Are the things that I'm looking for there or not? Uh, or to what extent are these concepts uh, available? And there's a technique that we use that I'll show you in a moment called categorization model development or dictionary development, which allows us to build a model, a semantic model around a concept, and we can see if that concept is in the data uh, or not. And then uh, we can use machine learning and we can use classification models, both supervised and unsupervised um, machine learning approaches. So with that, I'd like to turn to three uh, case studies to look at some of these techniques. And the first will be the IGF, and then if I have time, I'll turn to the SDGs and the CRPD. And the reason that this is important, uh, as I mentioned on Sunday, is we're in what I consider to be an important time, where there's the convergence of a number of disability-inclusive development policy frameworks globally. So we have um, the main one uh, that my colleague Jerry talked about earlier, the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which he introduced as a human rights, uh, the first human rights uh, treaty of the 21st century. It's also a development instrument. So it's a treaty that is both a human rights instrument and a development instrument. Uh, it is comprehensive, addressing almost every area of life from um, um, uh, awareness raising, recreation, education, culture, uh, almost uh, independent, uh, independent living, access to justice. So the treaty is very, very comprehensive. But we also have the Sustainable Development Goals and the High Level Political Forum, um, the WISIS plus 10 uh, policy processes, including the IGF um, that was renewed in that process, uh, Habitat 3 and the New Urban Agenda, which focuses on inclusive uh, cities that I know my colleague uh, Anthony also focuses on, as well as the Global Platform for Sustainable, uh, sustainable um, um, Disability Inclusive Disaster Risk Reduction uh, in the Sendai Framework. So all of these global policy frameworks are related to persons with disabilities. Uh, and so we have an opportunity now to advance disability inclusive development faster than we might have been otherwise. So what we want to do is to look at how each of those or many of those frameworks are actually advancing the cause of disability inclusive development. And we start with the IGF. So when we look at the IGF, we know that we've now had, uh, this is our 13th uh, IGF. And our study around the IGF is looking at what has the IGF talked about over its 12 years? What have been the key uh, focus areas, 
key concepts, key themes within uh, the IGF, and in particular, to what degree has the IGF talked about disability and, and some of the other specific uh, frameworks. So we have an opportunity of 12 years of uh, transcripts from the IGF driven in large part by the Disability uh, and Accessibility Coalition, a uh, dynamic coalition, because of the focus on making transcripts available for persons uh, who are uh, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, it's also of universal design benefit to everybody uh, who's in the room to be able to draw from the transcripts. And there's a, an ancillary benefit of now being able to have 12 years of transcripts to be able to mine. And so you think about everything that is said during the formal sessions and the workshops at an IGF. Think about all the sessions that are going on right now where you've chosen to be here with us, but there are all the parallel sessions that are going on right now. And this technique allows us to be able to mine uh, those transcripts to see uh, what we actually talked about. So what were the key themes at the IGF over 12 years? So if you look across all 12 years of the IGF from 2006 to 2017, the most dominant phrase that was uh, talked about uh, that we have access to was human rights. So IGF has been a human rights driven um, uh, vehicle. It's talked about human rights, freedom of expression uh, was next. We've talked about developing countries, young people, stakeholder, uh, data protection. But if you um, uh, uh, look across uh, the IGF, you also see using another technique called entity extraction, you see uh, women, cybersecurity, Internet of Things, uh, blockchain, and so forth. This is another technique uh, called hierarchical cluster analysis. This looks at how words were clustered together uh, and looks at their proximity, and it looks at themes and concepts based on this clustering of words. And this is just a, a, sh a short snapshot of the visual clustering of these words, um, and I'm showing this um, uh, pattern on screen with different colors for these clusters. So look at this first cluster, and you see the words abuse, sexual, child, images, uh, gender, women, men, violence, hate, and speech. So this cluster, and you can adjust how, how uh, tight or loose you want these clusters to be. This is obviously a cluster that was talked about at IGF related to uh, child sexual abuse and violence against women. Um, you can look at, um, on the far right-hand side, uh, smart city devices and Internet of Things, another cluster. So this is all coming from the text itself. Perhaps somebody who didn't even attend any of the IGFs is now able to get a really strong sense of what's here uh, within the IGF. Uh, we can also look at top phrases over the uh, different periods of time. And so you can see disability and accessibility were both very active uh, concepts in the IGF. Uh, if you look at topic modeling uh, over the years, we see accessibility in 2009, 2011, 2014, uh, and so over the years, we've seen disability and accessibility being a key component of uh, the IGF. Now I want to change to look quickly at um, the other two bonus case studies in my remaining two minutes here. Um, so uh, first I'll just say a little bit about uh, the SDGs and then a little bit about the CRPD. In fact, let me just jump ahead to the CRPD. I think that's probably most uh, important. So when we look at the CRPD, um, every country is required to submit a state report on how much progress it's making in implementing the CRPD. So Article 33 uh, of the CRPD talks about state implementation. Um, so we had a book that came out two years ago looking at uh, Southeast Asia and implementation of the CRPD in Southeast Asia. In order to do this, it was a very expensive project. We had to have teams of researchers on the ground in each uh, of the 10 countries in Southeast Asia. And we were able to make a lot of progress uh, looking at uh, what they focused on in Southeast Asia. But we wanted to look at the rest of the world, and we couldn't do that. We don't have teams on the ground in the rest of the world. And so what we did was we looked at all of those shadow reports. We created a, a corpus, a data set, a text-based data set of all of the state reports that have been submitted, as well as all of the shadow reports. So we have 88 uh, state reports and 103 uh, shadow reports. Um, and we built uh, what's called a categorization model, which let us look at the Article uh, 33 implementation components, which says there should be a focal point uh, and a coordination mechanism. There should be an um, independent human rights uh, uh, evaluation process based on the Paris principles. And the third is that there should be civil society uh, and DPO involvement. It should be multi-stakeholder. 
So we drill down into each of those three categories. That's why it's called a categorization model, to develop subcategories and then to develop specific words and phrases and rules that will let us tease out what are these uh, state reports focusing on, how much progress has been made in each of these three areas. And we can see very quickly here that almost all of the attention in the state reports has been focused on setting up the focal point, the, the intergovernmental focal point and the mechanism uh, to be able to uh, move forward, which is a good place to start. Uh, less has been focused on uh, um, the independent mechanism. In fact, almost no work has been put into the independent mechanism, the Paris principles, uh, and so forth. So I'm over time. I'm going to stop there, uh, Jerry, and I look forward to any questions or comments that we might have uh, later. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. That was, that was fascinating. It, it just shows, though, what we see or what many of society sees as just a, a um, something for people who are deaf or whatever can be taken and used by academia and be taken and used by people who are interested in gender or any other issue and used in that way and it's not just for people with disabilities as Ginella and others said earlier accessibility is not just about people with disabilities our last speaker, but by far not our, our, uh, our least speaker, is Anthony. And I'm not going to even try and announce his second name again. So, Anthony, 13 minutes, go. Thank you, Jerry. I will briefly be discussing today uh, a bit about um, lifelong learning and inclusive education in Norway and how we can really use ICT to help promote these activities. For those that don't know, inclusive or, uh, lifelong learning is, is basically learning in its purest form. It's self-directed, it's voluntary, it's ongoing throughout a person's life course. Uh, and it's, it could be for personal reasons, pursuing knowledge for the sake of pursuing knowledge. It could be for professional reasons to upskill or to become more competitive on the job market. But fundamentally, lifelong learning helps to promote social inclusion and active citizenship which is a huge component of, uh, of, of just participation in society. Now, it's important to start off by saying that in Norway, we very much look at disability as a component of the aging process. It's a component of life. Uh, statistically, we are all very likely to experience disability in some shape or form, particularly if we live long enough. Norway's focus on disability and inclusion is really rooted in the concept of universal design. And I have a very short video I'd like to play you uh, from the Norwegian government's. In the course of our lives, we all face obstacles sooner or later along the way. Stairs are no problem until one day you are standing there with a pram or crutches. That is when you are pleased someone has thought about you and you can keep on going. It's the same when you are online. Videos with subtitles are good for someone with hearing loss or a commuter on a train. Easy to read text is helpful for someone with impaired vision or if you've left your reading glasses at home. Keyboard navigation helps if you have a physical disability or if you're suffering from mouse arm. Society demands something from each of us. Yet when society's demands do not fit our needs, a gap arises. We need to mind this gap. In Norway, we want a society where everyone can join in. Therefore, we're working to reduce this gap. We're doing this in two ways. By strengthening the ability of individuals to join in. For example, when someone uses glasses when their vision is impaired, or when someone uses a wheelchair when they are unable to walk. And by changing society's demands, by adjusting them to a level that does not shut people out, by providing good technological solutions for everyone. Only then can we achieve universal design and a better life that is necessary for some and good for everyone. I think that last phrase captures it best when it says it's necessary for some but good for everyone. It's the spirit of universal design in many respects. So I believe that universal design can change the world. I believe that it has the power to transform our attitudes and our behaviors. Really where the, metal, uh, the pedal hits the road, or the metal hits the road, whatever that saying is. And this is particular when universal design is being applied to education and learning. Now I have the privilege to be able to, stand, to, be able to sit here in 2018 and discuss these ideas. 
These are ideas that in 1950, 1980, even 2000, were either unheard of, idealistic, or just considered absurd. Education, and especially higher education, has historically, and to some extent still is, accessible to only a small segment of the population, not only in Norway, but everywhere. And this runs counter to our human rights. According to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, states' parties have an obligation to ensure an inclusive education system at all levels, and that persons with disabilities are able to access general tertiary education, vocational training, adult education, and lifelong learning without discrimination and on an equal basis with others. That last clause is particularly pro pro provocative, that persons with disabilities have a right to access education on an equal basis with others. What does this mean for someone who is dyslexic to have access to education on an equal basis with others? What does this mean for someone with Down syndrome or someone who is on the autism spectrum? And since we're also talking about lifelong learning, what does it mean for someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's to have access to education on an equal basis with, the, with others. Now I'm a researcher and I can unequivocally say we have no idea. We have some knowledge about how to make some things work for some people some of the time, but we have no clue how to approach a system, an institution, like the learning and education institutions we all have in our countries, in a way that makes them truly universally designed. But fortunately, we do have this set of guide, this guiding light, this set of principles of universal design that the UN has given to us as a potential solution for ensuring that everyone can realize their right to education. So the United Nations defines universal design as a design of products, environments, programs, and services to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So universal design is essentially made up of three clauses. One, that learning and education, products, environments, programs, and services should be usable. Second, that usability should extend to everyone and in every possible way. And third, that use cannot require any kind of modifications or ad hoc solutions. That's a very simple but uncompromising view. So when we apply universal design to learning and education, I don't want to be misleading. Universal design does not mean one generic vanilla solution that tries to meet everyone's needs, but in reality meets the needs of no one. It means creating a solution that is one size fits one, not one size fits all. This means rejecting the idea that there's some kind of magical quote unquote average, typical, or quote unquote normal student. There are no average, normal, or typical students. All students lie on what's called the neurodiversity spectrum. And this is how we approach learning in Norway, by trying to take a student-centered approach to learning and trying to customize the learning experience for each student. Now, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect system. But it is a system that does enable students to participate on an equal basis. So this also means providing multiple ways for students to engage with the learning process. It means providing multiple ways for students to act and express themselves both in and out of the classroom. And it provi means providing multiple ways for representing information for the students. This means if all you're doing is lecturing <laughs> and giving an exam at the end of the semester, you are not universally designing your learning experiences. Now, when we talk about accessing education from a universal design perspective, we're focusing on removing barriers that emerge, emerge when an individual engages in a specific learning activity in a specific educational environment. Me, accessing learning content at home, sitting on my couch, using my iPad, is a very different experience than me sitting in a classroom watching the same presentation in a much more formalized setting.
The barriers that emerge in one environment may not be the same barriers that emerge in another environment. And we have to be conscious that learning, and in particular lifelong learning, is carried out in multiple different settings. One of the surest ways of ensuring that your educational experiences, your learning experiences, can be universally designed is by involving students as co-creators in learning processes. At my university, Oslo Metropolitan University, we directly involve students in the development of the courses that we offer. This means substantive involvement, not just come in, have a cookie, tell us what you think, now go home. And this also includes students with disabilities. And this is whenever we create new courses or programs. This is whenever we're designing learning outcomes for specific courses. This means determining what kind of formats are uh, useful and accessible for students learning, for assessing students' learning outcomes. And we also work with students in the design and development of new educational technologies, including things like e-learning systems, multimedia learning materials, and classroom technologies. And I mentioned design and develop, and I'll add to that list also procure. Because when your university or your educational institution is buying a piece of technology, it should never be purchasing something that is inaccessible or unusable for anyone at that school. And so by involving students in the design of learning experiences, it ensures that the courses and programs that we offer at Oslo Metropolitan University are accessible and usable for everyone. And I'd be grateful if we could continue this conversation online. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was excellent. Unusual for uh, IGF, we're actually ahead of schedule because some people uh, didn't use their full allocation of time. So we've got plenty of time for questions and answers. First, can I ask uh, the remote moderator, can our remote participants hear what's being said in the room? Shadi and Gunella and Shabir. Yes. Excellent, so you can join in in the conversation. Kayura on my left here is going to be my spotter, seeing that I'm blind. So, Shabir, uh, or Kayura, do we have any questions? Please Sorry, tell us who you are and maybe who you represent. Um, I'm Gudrun Stock. I work for the European Commission. I'm deputy head of unit in a unit dealing on, uh, with the Web Accessibility Directive. And uh, my question is to Anthony, asking whether a similar framework exists for school, um, secondary and primary school level education in Norway. The, uh, the obligations for universal design are uh, across all educational levels. Um, the implementation of those requirements are never um, the same. Uh, and in some ways it, it shouldn't be, in other ways uh, it's because there is a gap in the implementation process. Uh, so short answer, yes. And can I throw it back at you and ask you a question, please? You're involved with the Web Accessibility Directive. Can you maybe give us some time scales as to when that I know, I know the date when it came into force, but maybe some of the people in the audience didn't. So maybe you could talk just very briefly about that. So the transposition deadline for transposing the Web Accessibility Directive into national law was the 23rd of September uh, this year. And uh, it would mean that the um, old websites, so existing websites, they should be accessible by September 2019 and new websites by, that, uh, by 2020. And for mobile applications, it's as of 2021. So, I mean, it has to be transposed into law and then implemented, as you say, so the policy is there, and we're in process of implementing it and starting to monitor how that's working. Thank that's for, for public sector bodies and mobile applications of public sector bodies, actually, sorry. Thank you, there we go. We almost got a bonus presentation for free. <laughs> <laughs> Bonus information always helps. Kioro, any more spe uh, questions there, please? Okay. Uh, my, my name is uh, 
Peter Crosby. I'm from uh, Autistic Minority International. I'm uh, autistic, so my concern primarily is obviously cognitive access, and it's more a, a comment than a question, and it was perhaps even more touched on in the first talk this morning, and it's about the use of uh, guidelines and standards. Um, there seems to be a lot of faith being put on the ability of guidelines and standards to translate into outcomes for end users. And I would just have to say that from my point of view as an autistic person, I would really question that because I know site after site that supposedly meet guidelines where I can't even get in past the login page. So perhaps uh, there could be some, I don't know if anyone has any comment to say. I mean, there's lots of other things I'd love to talk about because it's all very interesting, but that in particular, and I know that um, there's someone that uh, perhaps the IGF could involve in, in the future is a guy called Jamie Knight who works for the BBC, who takes care of, uh, very involved in their, the BBC's accessibility, and he said, he's autistic as well, and he said that the BBC do not use guidelines and feel for them that they, they, they don't work, or they're not applicable, perhaps we could say. So. Shadi maybe as our standards bearer. Do you like to comment? Yeah, with, with pleasure. Yeah. Am I audible? Have we lost Shadi? Am I audible now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm not never sure when I'm muted here. Um, so, um, uh, I, I absolutely, I uh, th th this th the area of the, the broad area of uh, people with cognitive and learning disabilities, including uh, mental and and beha behavioral uh, disorders as, as as well, is 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 indeed an area where accessibility guidelines and standards need far more improvement. Um, and I'm saying this is a self-critique as well. This is an area where we have done some improvements in WCAG 2.1, but there's still many ways to go. I think it's also a research challenge in many cases, many situations. The actual requirements, the actual user needs are not well understood. Um, there is a lot of progress right now on um, so-called personalization semantics, uh, work that would allow uh, the, the parts of web pages to be described in a way that the machine could understand at the computer and could adapt the content in more personalized fashion to individual needs of individual users uh, because we know that particularly in that space um, one size doesn't fit all and, and, and that it needs a high degree of adaptability and, and, and personalization. And so uh, we are progressing on, on a lot of work in this area. But another thing to always keep in mind is that standards are tools um, and they're means to achieve accessibility and inclusion, but they're not the, you know, the, the end in themselves. Uh, they are helpers. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the right mindset, if you don't have the right uh, approach to universal design and to understanding your end users, uh, and designing for your end users rather than for any particular tool or standard, um, then um, it, you will usually um, not be as effective um, as if you're really trying to understand your end users and using the standards and guidelines as a way to, uh, to get there, as a way to achieve these, uh, as a condensed summary of a broad set of user requirements, but not all user requirements. Uh, it is something that is an ongoing development. As we learn more, as research provides us with more input, uh, we can define better user requirements. Okay, thank you. Anyone, uh, any other speaker like to comment about standards? Maybe I'll take the prerogative as a chairperson, just throw my own two pence word. International standards are voluntary. They're not mandatory. What makes them mandatory is the legislation that underpins them. And one of the things that has been happening very well in the last 10 years or so is the harmonization of standards across the world. 
There is a European standard called EN 301549, which is about the procurement of accessible ICT, which is harmonizing with the American Section 508, and which was adopted verbatim by Australia. So as standards become more commonly used across the world, it's, you don't have different requirements in France and Germany and Ireland and Australia and America. So it's easier for them to become mainstream and it's easier for the products that result from them to be cheaper rather than having different requirements elsewhere. And the other thing that I'd say about standards is we've heard a lot today about how accessibility is not just for people with disability. It's for older people and it's for various things. So if we can make, get that awareness out there that this benefits everyone, then the standards will be adopted. We had another lady with a question here. Thank you, Jerry. Judy. My name is Judy Okite. I come from Kenya. Um, listening to Shabir uh, making his presentation, I could easily say he's presenting on behalf of Kenya because it seems like it's the same across the board. I'll just wonder whether there's any best practices concerning um, the things he's talking about, more especially the many policies that we have that are not being implemented. Um, what do we do about that? And then um, for Derek, I would like just to ask, apart from the discussions that we've had at the IGF, um, probably this is something we will discuss at the DICAD meeting, um, whether the accessibility issues that we've talked about are being implemented or not. But I'll be more interested to know on the data mining whether there's any information on the participation for persons with disability, whether it has increased over the years at the IGF or it has decreased. Thank you. Derek? Shabir, did you want to come in on that? We give the remote participation first. No, go ahead. Okay, Derek, the question, is there more participation by people with disabilities at the IGF? Have you mind that? So, um, so the, the data set that we're looking at is the transcripts from the sessions, so the main sessions. And if you go back, um, uh, Anthony, I don't know if you can switch over, but if you go back, um, keep going on. So we had uh, 1,020 transcripts, and if you look over the 12 years, you can see that it started out slowly uh, with 11 transcripts, I think, the first year. Um, but, even, but I think that's important. So even the first year, uh, we did have uh, transcripts from the, uh, from the sessions. Uh, going up to 114 transcripts in uh, 2010 in Vilnius, uh, Istanbul with 138 transcripts, um, all the way up through to, uh, let's say, in, uh, Geneva and Guadalajara, 215 and 205. So the number of transcripts is in increasing. So the, the amount of coverage of what this data set looks at for IGF has been growing. So originally, if you look at 11 transcripts, that didn't cover the whole, you know, three or four days that we were in Athens. You know, it was only in certain sessions and so forth. But now we're getting to the point where I would say pretty much everything that is said in a main session or any of the workshops uh, that has captioning is covered. So we can see that um, we can look for trends and patterns in what is being said uh, in terms of the, the content. Uh, something else that we could mine would be um, the user list, uh, you know, sort of participant list, where people are coming from. All of this text becomes possible data for us, and that's one of the reasons I like uh, the kind of work that we're doing so much and we need more people who want to do this kind of work because it, there's, a, there's an enormous amount that one could mine from these kinds of meetings. You could, you could um, uh, mine all of the submissions that came in uh, for workshops. You could mine 
um, all of the regional IGFs uh, as well. So anything that's text could be used as data. And so there are a number of questions like that and others that we could explore. Um, and so in terms of the people with disabilities that are participating, um, I don't think that's indicated anywhere on the participant list or anything like that, but in terms of the content across IGF that's related to disability, we could, we could mine a whole range of those uh, kinds of issues. And like I didn't get to show with, uh, well, I was gonna show you cybersecurity and how that as a concept uh, unfolds. If there's a particular topic that you might be interested in, um, such as universal design, for example, or accessibility standards. So you can build a categorization model that can be simple or complex around just that concept and see how that concept has uh, unfolded over the course uh, of the 12 years. So I'd be happy to work with you or anybody, Judy, to think about things that you might be interested in looking for in this data set to see if it's there or not. Thank you, Derek, and thank you, Judy, for the question. Time for one last one. Going, going, <laughs> done. Okay, well then that just leaves me, everybody, to say really, this has been great. I'm really interested in the attention from the audience. I'd like to thank all our speakers. I'd like to thank the IGF, the amount of work that they did to ensure that the remote participation took part. I'd like to remote all the accessibility services that are involved. It's amazing how much work goes into this. I'd like to take Keoro here beside me from ITU, who helped with, with uh, all the hard work coming up to it. Andrea, who's not here. Andrea is always present, even if she's not here. With an amazing amount of people involved just to make this happen. I want to leave you with one thought. We're talking about accessibility, and we're talking about how it, it relates to the greater uh, mainstream of society. And we find that when we're talking about accessibility, we say in the technology area where I am, we're talking more now to UX people, user experience people, rather than just um, universal design people. And we find that more. We are getting more involved in the mainstream. Ginella was talking about IoT and so on. Right? Diversity is the norm in society now. Everyone, it's okay to be different, because everyone's different. And I want to leave you with one last thought. Whether it's here at IGF, here in the room, or in your place of education, or in your place of work, or in your place of leisure, your place of worship, wherever you come together with a common purpose, unity is our strength, but diversity is our wealth. Thank you all very much.